Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Kyle Zimmer, the president and CEO of First Book. Kyle has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kyle, for joining us today. Delighted to be here. So First Book is a very unique nonprofit. It doesn't actually operate in a conventional, according to a conventional model. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about First Book, its history, its work, and it's uh, and and how the the organization functions well first book as an idea really sprang from very personal interactions i was a lawyer here in washington dc and right at the end of the 80s uh during the middle of the crack epidemic so it was a really tough time for for my hometown here and I started volunteering because I figured I needed to roll up my sleeves and be part of a solution. And, uh, and I was volunteering right down the street and I, uh, I became very aware of the lack of educational resources. And so, you know, it started bothering me and I started, I became a student of the industry, of the publishing industry. And I think because of my private sector roots and the private sector roots of my co-founders, we approached it, you know, you bring to the party whatever, whoever you are, right? And, and so we approached it from a very private sector angle right out of the gate. We said, what is wrong with the industry that the price point of an average premium picture book is $18? And totally out of the reach of, of so many children who, right. for $18, particularly in those days. Correct, and, and you know when you're selling an $18 picture book that you really, your market is really the top 5%. Right. Right, and, and that might be okay if you're talking about socks, uh, but it's not okay if you're talking about the single tool that is the major component of creating a, an educated, culture, an educated community. You know, right from the beginning, what we realized that this problem is too big and too important to not look for a broad, systemic, and sustainable solution, right? So we never set out for a local or a regional solution because we thought whatever we're seeing here in our hometown of Washington, D.C., we know to be the case where I grew up in Appalachia. We know to be the case in the Midwest and the Southwest. You know, there are over 30 million children in the United States who are growing up in low-income households. It's an unprecedented number. We know right now that 51% of kids in US public schools are from low income households. We've never been that high. And so we knew whatever we had to design had to be designed with an economic engine that was self-sustaining because we would never be able to grow a traditional nonprofit based on sheerly on donations that would meet that need. So 25 years when you, uh, ago, when you, when you created your first solution, what did that solution look like? What was that program? What did the child receive? Well, it's a really great question because First Book has morphed over, like right. every great business, right? It has morphed over the years. And so when we came out of the gate, we designed something called the First Book National Book Bank. What we realized is that the publishing industry is a consignment industry. And so every year, even in the best of circumstances, the, they know, back. oh yeah, and they know they're gonna get 25 to 30% of what they manufacture is gonna come roaring back. And right? that's a logistics uh, challenge, right? Because- I think nightmares. So, right? Well, nightmare, I was, <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but you have to, you produce the books, you produce the books based on a, a, a certain demand curve and right. also the fact that, that not having a book available is so costly to the manufacturer, so you Correct. you overstock, right. and then you have the, all these costs of moving these books to another location and then storing them until they're sold. Correct. Um, and and trying to figure out how to match the location um, of the book to the location of demand is is very difficult. You actually provide a business solution that then has a philanthropic 
uh, impact. Correct. And so our first model, and we have moved on, and I want to make sure yes, I talk about yes. the next one because I'm even more excited about that. But the first model was to address the excess inventory in the industry. And the first book, National Book Bank, still is roaring. It's in its 23rd year. Um, and what it does is it accepts those very large scale uh, contributions of books from publishers. I, we work with more than 90 imprints uh, across the US and Canada. And we make them available to anyone who is registered with us. And it's a very simple process to register. You just have to show that you're either a Title I school, Title I eligible, or serving 70% kids in need at a minimum. And anyone in our network uh, can access the First Book National Book Bank books. The books remain free, and all they pay is a shipping and handling charge of about 60 cents a book, something like that. And it, it's a boon for the industry because, you know, these are people who love books, and the last thing they wanted to do was destroy the books or or you know, put them in a landfill or pulp them or whatever. They were delighted to, to provide the books to kids in need, but it had to be in a way that was economically manageable for them. And so we really built this massive system that you know, I, you know, every year places between 10 and, and 13 million books uh, through our We do 10 network. and 13 million books. And the reason why I wanted you to describe the first model, because the yep. first model is very comprehensible, but what you have done is you've taken this way of thinking, this whole idea of engaging people in developing solutions that are philo philanthropically potent, but also has have an underlying business logic to them, that create very robust solutions that uh, where where part of the solution is also how you fund the actual solution itself. So, absolutely. Talk about some of the other solutions that you've developed over the years and, sure. and, and the extent of your operations today. Sure. Well, you know, um, we on a regular basis at First Book, I always tease the team and say, you know, we're happy with what we've built, but we're never satisfied. And it's it's you know, you can drink your own Kool Aid uh, and be and be gloriously happy about your, you know, 170 million books we've placed in the hands of kids. And that's all great, but the reality is, is every morning we have to wake up and remember that we're really only serving about 25% of the kids who need us. And right. so there's a harsh reality that continues to push us toward innovation after innovation, because in order to reach those kids who are waiting, we know we need the new business models. And so we looked at the first book, National Book Bank, and it's still running. It's, it's doing really well. But, but we said, what's great about it? Well, what's great about it is it's very high volume and it's very low cost per unit. That's right. terrific. Uh, what's not great about it is that it doesn't give educators what they need. It gives them what we have. That's a disconnect. It also doesn't fix the problem with the industry. It doesn't reset or open a new market at the base of the economic pyramid. What it does, it's an end of the pipeline solution, right? right? And, and furthermore, we knew uh, that when we put our binoculars on, we could see that, you know, like every industry, the publishers were going to get wiser and wiser about uh, trimming excesses out of there. Of course, right. they have to. And, and so you relied on the inefficiency, and and you were dealing with the inefficiency. But right. but as people become better, the inefficiency diminishes, and therefore Correct. the supply, what you are supplying, diminishes. And right. and eventually, if they're hundred percent efficient, there's zero supply. That's exactly right. And so we we watched the bad, and we thought it through. And and about eleven years ago, we sharpened our pencils and. Uh, built something called the First Book Marketplace. And we went to the publishing industry with a very simple business proposition. We said, uh, your books are, we had done the, the survey work and, and all of our homework, and we said, your books are priced out of range for the bottom third of the market. These are people who, in the, in the groups we're supporting, the Head Starts, the homeless shelters, Title I classrooms, they have some money, they have a little bit of money, but they don't have the resources to meet the market pricing. And so 
we proposed to them that we would knock every major cost and risk off the table that we possibly could. And uh, we, we, for the first time ever, said, let's do, let's open this new market at the base of the pyramid on a non-consignment basis across the board. So we will purchase inventory from you and it will be non-returnable. And that changes the conversation, right. of course. And we said, we will purchase, but you will not have customer acquisition costs. Uh, you will not have advertising costs. We're going to talk to our own market. And a certain amount of your production workflow is planable and predictable, mm -hmm. as well as your revenue. So you, you take out that issue as well. You take out some of the friction in the system. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So, so the first book marketplace now uh, entering its 11th year, um, it, it uh, has grown by over 20% annually every year of its existence. In the early years, of course, that's not as challenging, but we're really proud to say that it's grown in excess of 20% even in these most, most recent years. And we offer over 6,000 titles. Uh, we offer eBooks, we offer tablets. We, you know, we have really begun pushing uh, the parameters of what we can offer to this market because we know that kids in this, in this population, they need everything. They need exposure to everything. They need sports equipment and they need, uh, but they can't meet the market price. And so first book is utterly focused on books. Of course, that's our centerpiece. But as we've grown, we've also begun to realize that our true mission, our true north, is eliminating all the resource barriers between that child in need and an equal and quality education. And that's the real American dream. We, we too often couch the American dream in terms of possessions or owning a particular thing, a home or a car right. or whatever it is. But the true American dream is that every child can rise to the level of, of their own, that their own energy takes them. They have every opportunity to be who they, who they can become. And it also frees up all this intelligence, all this capability, all this energy, because those children are our futures. It's, it's so thrilling. Even I've been doing this for 25 years. After all these years, walking into a classroom, talking to the teachers, seeing the lights in their eyes because they, and they tell us all the time about the fact that they know that they can reach more kids because they now have first book resources. They know that they can provide resources that go into the homes and they know how important that is because a kid needs 360 degree surround sound of books and, and quality resources. And then seeing the lights go on in the room and the eyes of the kids, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. And it's so simple in part, you know? I mean, you think it's books, it's resources that a lot of us are lucky enough to take for granted. A fascinating story, Kyle Zimmer. It has been such a pleasure to hear about <laughs> the, the energy of First Book. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, and thank you so much for your insights. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much.